this is, it's a sensitive topic and I want to acknowledge that the things that I'm talking about are difficult. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not there with you. Uh, we're, we're connecting via virtual means. And so just a reminder that as we're going through this, this conversation, if you need to take a pause, you can. The material is being recorded. You can always come back to it. If you need to turn away from your screen for a moment, if you need to stand up and stretch, engage with your body, engage with how you're feeling. And I hope that you can be very gentle with yourself um, because grief is, is no small task. This is, it's a lifelong journey. It spreads out into many avenues uh, and areas of our lives. And we want to be uh, as compassionate with ourselves as we can. The more compassionate we are with ourselves, the more compassionate we can be with our colleagues, our friends, our, our clients, patients, um, everyone that we interact with. But the practice starts internally. And so um, let's let's start off on the right foot by by focusing that that care and compassion inwards. And so. Today, uh, our goals are going to be around defining grief. We're going to work with some definitions and hopefully expand your definition of grief to, to not just think about it in um, a very rigid way. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the stages of grief, and this is something that um, has been helpful for some and not helpful for others. Uh, the stages of grief have kind of influenced and jumped into pop culture in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, and sometimes have been interpreted in really rigid ways that has not been helpful for people. And so we're going to talk about um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's initial ideas around stages of grief uh, and hopefully get back to that uh, that origin story uh, to, to implement it in our own lives. We're going to talk practical things. So I'm, I'm a chaplain. Uh, so my role is often surrounded by rituals and practices. And so we're going to talk about some of the rituals that you can create, and hopefully that'll give you the inspiration to be creative about how you engage with your grief, uh, and then finding good and healthy self-care techniques. And finally, we want to look at how we help others. You know, all of these, these first three goals are about what we do internally, and as we work on ourselves, we can turn that work outward uh, to support others who are engaging in grief. Uh, remembering there's there's no one way to do it. There are some things that we can do that are maybe not the best technique, but uh, most, you know, we, we can be really open with how we engage our grief and work through it. So uh, when we face any kind of loss, we may feel unsure of what to say or do. Uh, we may feel old losses or unresolved pain stir up again. We may feel that our loss isn't as bad as somebody else's. Uh, we have a strong tendency to, uh, to make a hierarchy and sometimes put ourselves last, especially those of us who are in helping professions. Uh, we may feel like we should be getting over this faster. We give ourselves timelines. We're used to working with timelines in our work, and sometimes that applies in our personal lives. Um, we may feel stuck. So uh, when we have all of these complexities surrounding our grief, we want to find ways to care for ourselves and others. And so a big part of this conversation that we're having today uh, will help us to share what to say and what not to say. Uh, to normalize grief, and I'm using big and small, um, but if it's if it seems small to you, it might be big for someone else. And so uh, I'm using that because you know these are terms that we often use. But acknowledging that grief is grief, uh, whether it would impact somebody in a in a small way, but it impacts you in a big way. There's no judgment there. Uh, it is it is a it is one of the most difficult things we do as humans is to to go through the grief process. And so however it impacts you, it is important to be gentle and, and care for, for yourself. We want to find ways to cope, to heal, and to work with grief, uh, and then to help our colleagues, peers, friends, and staff to grieve well in the work environment. Um, some of these things we hope will be able to be expanded to your your communities, whatever those look like, your neighborhood, your friends, your family. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna be taking a lot of time to focus on particularly the work environment. 
Um, I'm gonna engage. I'm, I'm gonna encourage you to use the chat. Um, we'll we'll take pauses throughout to take a look at the chat and make sure that if you have questions that we we answer them. And um, you know, feel free that if if you have a question that's more of a personal nature than a professional nature, we're we're covering grief in many different ways. Uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So remember, we're we're just kind of getting a, a primer on grief here. Um, but there's a lot more to be to be said. So as is my practice, I like to start with an opening reflection uh, just to get ourselves settled. And so I'm going to invite you wherever you are to uh, find yourself uh, a centered space. If you're sitting or standing, uh, notice what's holding you up and ground yourself on the, the ground below you. Um, as I said at the beginning, conversations around grief can be really difficult, and it can bring up expected and unexpected pain, uh, things that you didn't expect would, would come up. And so we're going to take a break to breathe and pause throughout the lecture, but we're going to start with a, a brief meditation. So if you feel comfortable and you're in a place that you can close your eyes, I invite you to do so. And I invite you to take three deep breaths. I know some of you might be in a semi-public place, but uh, allow that breath to be a, an audible exhale and really release everything that you're holding on to. Notice how when you start to be intentional about your breath, how maybe it slows down a little bit. Notice the tension that you're carrying. Find a good rhythm for your breath that soothes your body and your mind. You know, it's allergy season, so breathing in through your nose may be difficult, but I do invite you to try to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And I'm gonna do, I'm gonna invite you to do something with me as you are continuing to find your breath and find your pacing. Keep that breath going at a rhythm that works for you. And I invite you to imagine grief. Personify it, give it an image. Can you hold it in your hand? Is it that elephant in the room sitting next to you? Does it surround you? Does it tug at your shirt behind you? If you imagine grief, where is it in your body? Where does it take residence? Is it floating in your mind? Is it surrounding your heart? Is it a pit in your stomach? Is it a heaviness at the bottom of your feet? You're not gonna get rid of the grief. We're not going to take it and throw it away. We're not gonna throw it across the room. I want you to just get acquainted with it. And as you're breathing, take a moment. And with this grief that you have imagined in your mind's eye, just say hello to it. Say, I know you're gonna be here with me. Take a deep breath. And release the stress and acknowledge the grief that is accompanying you on this journey together. I'm gonna to invite you to take three more deep intentional breaths, ideally in through the nose and out through the mouth. Let that audible exhale release the stress that you're carrying. Give a nod to your grief and we'll get started. So we're gonna talk about definitions. So a proper definition is uh, deep and poignant distress uh, generally caused by uh, bereavement, um, a cause of suffering like uh, a loss of an, an individual or an, a thing, a part of your life. 
Um, but I want to see if we can uh, tell, start, let me know what, what do you define as grief or what sort of things do you grieve or have you grieved? Maybe even what brought you here today uh, that when you saw that there was a lecture on grief that you thought, oh, I want to, I want to learn about this. What are the topics around grief that you're connected with? I think you're going to have to put them in the chat and I'm going to look at the chat. Um, and so feel free to, in the chat, put in uh, any of your definitions of grief or types of grief that you're thinking about or experiencing. I'm going to give you just a second to do that and I'll read them out just so we can see what everyone else is thinking. I'm pretty sure you can also post anonymously if you're concerned about that, but uh, take the next 15, 20 seconds to throw some answers in the chat for me. Loss of partner, loss of spouse, loss of career, loss of father, Loss of mother, loss of mother. A feeling of emptiness and loss of, of a husband. Loss of self, powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Loss of sister. Mm. So someone, uh, a chaplain at a nonprofit. Whatever loss that the staff or participant may be experiencing, yeah? Feeling the loss of another person. Mm, pain dealing with an unexpected loss of a nephew. Loss of times gone by. Loss of purpose. Thank you all for sharing that. And I know this is, it's a vulnerable space. Um, and I don't get to be there with you in person. So uh, it can, as much as we're used to this virtual realm, I do want to acknowledge that uh, my heart is with you all that that shared and those that you are thinking of this. Um, we're going to keep looking at these at these things in the chat and we'll share them as we go. Serious health diagnosis. I thank you for sharing that. We're going to keep going. And we're going to keep talking about these these things. Um, we're broadening our definition of grief. And I think you all have already started this conversation going. Um, a lot of times people think of loss in that physical loss. Uh, so death uh, or anticipated death of a loved one, um, death or anticipated death of a pet, uh, a death of a significant or famous or inspirational person, figure, um, the death or the anticipated death of a colleague, infertility, pregnancy loss, and then physical injury, or illness. Um, so a lot of times we are, we're thinking about those physical losses when we talk about, talk about grief. Um, but today we're getting, we're expanding that. Like I said, at the beginning, we're also talking about the emotional and existential losses. So loss of a job, uh, that has been something that has been certainly talked about a lot more these days because of all the changes since the pandemic. Um, also our loss of a role. How many of us went from working, uh, physically in an office to doing work at home uh, or, or changing our role in a system. If our loved one might've lost a job, um, has, our, has our role changed in our family system that we are now the primary breadwinner or, um, or have we, we switched our role to being a caretaker of, of loved ones at home or of children? Um, loss of health and ability, um, financial losses are a huge grief ending or changing relationships. Um, these can be romantic. A lot of times people think about, um, you know, divorce or uh, an end, a, a breakup, um, but even friendships. Think about friends that you may have lost touch with who have moved on to different stages of life and, uh, or moved physically. And that relationship is either ended or, uh, or changed in a way that is very different than it used to be. Uh, colleagues leaving for any kind of reason. Sometimes we're celebrating them, uh, but by them leaving the place that they were always present with you, uh, that is a loss. And then organizational change. It's not the way we used to do it. It's different than when we, the way we used to experience it. Um, and then I want to talk about complex losses. 
Um, these are often things that uh, on the surface are, are celebrated uh, in many ways. And sometimes we don't give room for the grief component of, of a major change. So marriage, uh, having or adopting children, uh, growing your family in some way. We talk about celebrations. There's a big party. There's, there's so much uh, a joy, baby showers, uh, you know, graduations, new jobs, promotions. All of these things are things that we generally focus on the celebratory aspects of it. But all of them come with a change from the way it used to be. And so acknowledging that marriage, uh, having children, graduation, all come with losses and uh, giving space for the complexity of those emotions. Um, my training as a chaplain uh, often makes me pause to check in with the emotional uh, the emotional content of a situation. And so somebody saying, you know, I, we're celebrating getting married, I allow them to tell me all that that means to them uh, and not just assume that it is all joy for them. Um, because maybe the first time that they had to check in with somebody in a different way than they ever did when they were single might be a, a place of grief. Moving, uh, leaving the place that you once loved, a place of grief. So acknowledging that even things that have the other side of the coin be very joyful and happy and exciting do have loss built into them. And so we're in our in our practices and in our rituals, we're going to talk about spaces for us to acknowledge uh, all sides of grief. So Brene Brown writes, we run from grief because loss scares us. Yet our hearts reach towards grief because the broken parts want to mend. Grief is a process. It is uh, a component of being human and living our lives. And when you work with and through grief, you are able to heal. Uh, something that uh, I was talking to a grief counselor about the other day was how many of us are playing grief catch up right now. Um, because we did not spend time to resolve earlier griefs during the pandemic. Um, I take a moment to think back to that March 2020 when uh, we started uh, anticipating some changes uh, and think back to, I recall feeling like this is going to be two weeks. It's going to be two weeks and then we'll be back to normal. And of course, did not give it time to grieve because it's only two weeks, you know, that minimizing of grief. And because of that minimizing, it got tucked into the background when that two weeks became a month, when that month became six months. And now all of a sudden, here we are three years later with a pileup of grief. And so each new grief one experiences, it often brings up the old griefs that were not resolved. It's normal for grief to come up uh, even even things that are healed or or experienced or talked through, but when we haven't worked through it, that's when we start uh, turning to more negative coping mechanisms and when we feel like we're really struggling with grief. And so we want to find healing uh, to process uh, the the complexities of past grief, current grief, and anticipatory grief. So an interesting uh, component of our history is uh, the the study and uh, understanding of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She There was an um, amazing program on NPR a couple weeks ago, I think it was on The Pulse, um, that really dove into her life, which if I find the link, <laughs> I will try to find a way to send it out to y'all because it was, I really enjoyed it. Um, and there's so much complexity around grief, mainly because grief is often associated with death and we as a culture are a little afraid of death. Uh, it's, it's often something that's hard to talk about and um, there's some resistance there. So her early work was focused around getting the story of what it is to die uh, as, a, as a patient knowing that they would, they were had a terminal illness and to see what their process was. So this was actually more about 
the person facing end of life than it was about the people losing that individual. Now, that has been expanded and understood in, in broader ways. And one of the things that happen with when a part of psychology becomes popular is sometimes it becomes a little too rigid. And I think that's what happened with the, the grief cycle is that people began expecting that the Kubler-Ross grief cycle would become is is structured, linear, and time sensitive, when in reality grief is not any of those things. Um, it is often uh, complicated. It is not doesn't move in a straight line, and so the stages that she noticed uh, and saw frequently in her patients that she gave space to share their stories uh, were denial which came in the form of avoidance, confusion, sometimes excitement, uh, and shock and fear. Uh, the next stage she saw often coming up was anger. So uh, often denial comes first, but it doesn't mean that it always does. Um, but as you come to understand what the thing that is you're grieving, uh, a feeling of, of frustration, oh. irritability, anxiety. A lot of people like to talk about the bargaining one because it's an interesting stage of, of grief and of dying is uh, trying to find meaning, trying to help others, trying to tell your story, uh, trying to find a way out of the grief that one is experiencing. Uh, feelings of depression. This is the the fear of being with someone who's crying is very common. People don't know how to how to be present in the in the midst of of deep sadness. Um, and depression can feel like helplessness, uh, hostility, and avoidance. And finally, acceptance, uh, which is where we where we want to be, where we can explore new opportunities, introduce new plans, kind of experiment with how we might move forward in a new way. Um, but once again, it's not linear. Uh, people will sometimes tell me, uh, you know, as I'm I'm caring for people who uh, are dying or who have lost a loved one, they'll say, "Oh, you know, I." I was in the depression phase, but you know, I'm moving towards acceptance. But the reality is you might, you might get to that acceptance place. It doesn't mean that you'll stay there. It might mean that something will trigger anger again, that a new con concept will come in as you're wrestling with grief and you may feel um, depression or denial again. Uh, it's very normal to have to kind of experiment with new realities, experiment with this is what my life will look like after this loss, and then to find that it wasn't what you expected, to find that, uh, you know, so I'm caring for a lot of people who have lost a loved one who lived with them, that they think, oh, well, I've made the new, I've made our home feel more comfortable for me now. I feel like I can, I can live here. And then all of a sudden they come to a holiday and they say, no, I can't celebrate this holiday here without them. I can't, I, the grief comes back up. It's very normal because it is not purely linear. And this is where that self-compassion needs to come in for us and for others. Um, a lot of people like to throw that six month timeline around. And while there are some really good, uh, there's really good studies about, you know, if, if deep and uh, immovable grief is not uh, worked through in six months. Yeah, I think getting some supports some therapeutic supports are, is absolutely appropriate. But to think that all grief would be done in six months, that's where we get into trouble. Uh, because we feel grief because of a deep love. And so that love doesn't just go away. So acknowledging that these things will be more cyclical. So we want to talk about <clears throat> ways that we can we can heal uh, and move through loss. And so I'll start with a story. Uh, I was caring for a staff uh, who lost one of their colleagues. Uh, they were very, uh, they loved him very much. He was an essential part of their community. Uh, they described him as somebody who had great fashion he brought great joy. He was a, a personality that uh, just like had that kind of infectious joy. And his loss was deeply felt. And uh, 
the the process of coming to work every day uh, really like it felt like hitting a wall for them because they didn't see him anymore. And so one of the things that we can do with that loss, with a, a physical loss of an individual is to create a ritual, <coughs> pardon me. Um, and so we did a service for him. Um, we lit, they weren't, they weren't candles like these, they were electric candles. We lit candles and we created a space uh, to honor him. And so they put up a picture of him, uh, made it very colorful and bright. And it was a way that they could still see him even though they couldn't see him anymore. Um, and so it's important to meet people where they are and to hear the story of what they're going through while um, thinking about ways to preserve the memory and give space for healing and remembrance. <coughs> I'm sorry, my allergies are terrible and so I'm very dry. So these are some of the, the rituals that we can engage in uh, to, to help us to practice uh, a form of, of healing, especially in our communities. Uh, there, there is no one right way to do it. <coughs> Oftentimes we think of rituals purely in a religious sense uh, and religions, uh, many, almost all religions have some form of ritual that are often hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So there's a reason why uh, uh, many uh, individuals will uh, utilize these services because they've worked. I'm gonna pause, I have a question. Was it an ecumenical service? If so, can you recommend some resources? Yes, um, almost all, unless I'm doing something privately for a family, almost all of the services that I provide are um, interfaith, uh, uh, multi-faith or, or ecumenical. Um, I want to make them as open and uh, uh, welcoming of all people, whether they have a faith tradition or not. Um, and we'll help people engage in their respective faith traditions if there is meaning to be made there. Uh, so there are, there are many different rituals that one can find, but I recommend consulting with an interfaith chaplain. We do have chaplains throughout mainline health. Um, there are a lot of different, if you were to search rituals for, um, a funeral, rituals for loss of a colleague, you can find a lot of pre-written, uh, services that you can edit for the specific need of the individual. Um, and there even, uh, Harvard Business Review wrote an article about, uh, ways of honoring the loss, losses in, in, um, in a, in a workplace. Um, so uh, it is, I can certainly, I'm going to give you all my contact information. So if there are specific resources you're looking for, please let me know. But it is, it's more of a common practice to build ritual and practices into our, um, into our workplaces to help us engage and, and make meaning. Um, so yes, memorial services and funerals. That's what most people think of. It has music, flowers, candles, someone gives speeches, um, sometimes planting a, a tree in, in memorial of someone, um, making memorial spaces with pictures and, and images, things that were important to the individual. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, another very, very broad way of, of making a, a ritual is setting an intention for the day. And so this is something for any kind of grief that you might be experiencing, whether it is the loss of an individual or the loss of, um, of something that was, was part of your life. Um, creating an intention that speaks to that place of acceptance that you hope to one day be. Acknowledging you may not be there right now, but having a practice of every morning I wake up and I say, I will be at peace where I am. I will... I will find I will find connection in a way that is that is healing for me. Um, <clears throat> whatever that might be, setting an intention is an individual way, or you can do it corporately as a community or in your in your 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 group. Uh, that's something that all can engage in with a sense of of hope for the future. 
uh, when there is a loss of a, a significant person or um, or a concept, you can find a, a quote or um, significant image that you can post and have somebody somewhere centered for the community. When, <clears throat> when you're processing through loss, uh, writing a letter can be uh, a great way of, of working through loss. Um, narrative medicine has, has increased in popularity uh, in the past 10 years or so. And a lot of the prompts that they use in the practice of narrative medicine are writing letters to your past self, to a person you lost, uh, to the person you hope to be one day. Um, all of us engage in journaling in different ways. Uh, there were seasons of my life where I was an avid journaler. I could sit and write five, six pages by hand every night. And I will tell you right now, I am not. <laughs> uh, I am. I have a four-year-old and I'm tired at the end of the day and I'm not going to sit down and write in my journal. It's just not the place that I am in life. And so instead I use an app. I plug in what happened that day and type in a couple of answers to, to process my day, to reflect, to see patterns in my life. And that works. Um, so we're going to keep practicing that grace that we talked about at the beginning, that if writing a full letter is not going to work for you, sit in your car and talk to yourself for 15 minutes and put that put those those words out to the person that you you wish that you could have said them to. Um, so however you can get the the feelings that are deep inside out into out of your body in, in some way. <clears throat> Going to a place that was significant uh, before your loss. So visiting your first home, if you're reflecting on moving or growing up or something that changes. Uh, go to the place that you used to eat lunch with your favorite colleague uh, and, and make a new memory there. Um, go to your where you went to school, where you went to, went to college, where you graduated from. Find <clears throat> those significant places and, and have a moment to pause, to reflect, to move your body and to say goodbye. <laughs> Using breath, meditation, visualization, and prayer, depending on your personal tradition, is a great way to engage in the somatic uh, forms of healing. And so many studies have shown that uh, we hold our trauma, we hold our loss in our bodies. Uh, you can see that in, in many different ways, whether uh, you're meditating and you start feeling uh, deep the, the loss coming up in a deep way. Some people have talked about um, acupuncture or massage or yoga, tai chi, that as they're moving, they can physically feel the loss kind of coming up within them. And so engaging in a practice that works for you, for your, your personal um, belief system and practice, uh, and that engages your body. Um, in a lot of understanding of trauma stewardship, we know that trauma is held in the body. And so engaging the whole body in, in a way that is meaningful to us can allow us to, to bring those things up. Uh, a lot of us use donating money or time or you know uh, engaging in walks or runs or fundraisers, making meaning out of the losses that we've experienced um, and, and putting towards a hope for the future. And then of course, uh, religious cultural rituals around death and dying. Uh, there's a reason why our, our religious and cultural traditions have been doing these things for so long. And so if it's something that's meaningful to you or to your family, your, your family of origin, then use what you can use to, to work through the loss that you may experience. Um, <clears throat> we recommend therapy, coaching, spiritual direction. Uh, therapeutic supports are, are great to have come alongside you. Support groups. Uh, for some, especially in the immediacy of grief, sometimes being around a group of people sharing similar things can feel re-triggering. So all of these things are meant to be uh, assessed for the individual. So if that works for you, then then try it. But certainly if it's if it feels like it's re-traumatizing, you don't have to keep working towards that. Um, movement, walking, running, physical exercise to engage emotions, acknowledging and validating emotions. Sometimes the most powerful thing that we can do is to acknowledge uh, the feelings that we are expressing. Um, I was with <clears throat> I was with a patient who uh, I'd estimate 
probably in his 30s or 40s. Um, he is an African-American man and he, this was, uh, I guess almost two years ago, maybe a year ago, he was talking to me about Chadwick Boseman and Black Panther and the, the, the movie and, and Chadwick's death. And he got deeply emotional and said, Every time he his, he really likes the Marvel movies, very very interested in in the the Marvel universe, and was was at one point weeping, um, thinking about the loss of Chadwick and uh, who, if you are not interested, if you're not into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he is a superhero character and amazing actor who passed away um, from cancer. I, it might be going on two years now. Um, and he felt a lot of shame as he was processing this loss because he said, I don't know him. He's, he's an actor. Why am I so sad about this? He's, he's a comic book actor. There's so much judgment around comic book movies. And we paused to acknowledge that it was a loss. And I said, what other losses might, might be coming up for you right now? And he acknowledged that he was wrestling with the loss of, um, of his own, he was in the hospital, loss of his own function, waiting on test results for himself, uh, the loss of, of his father to um, a form of cancer, um, and then the loss of somebody who was significant in his, his cultural experience. He processed that he didn't have a lot of Black superheroes growing up and that this was significant to him. And so the losses were compounded and uh, giving space to say, you know, just because it's a celebrity that you didn't know, I can see the deep pain that you're experiencing. Um, do you want to share more about what that grief is like for you? Giving space for emotion and not saying, oh yeah, you don't know Chadwick Boseman. You don't know Princess Di. You didn't know Mother Teresa. You, like you didn't know a lot of people felt the same way about um, Robin Williams. If, if somebody has that deep connection to somebody who is distant from them, whether famous or not, um, we don't know what's going on. And so acknowledging and validating the emotions of the other, allow them to continue to tell the story and process uh, and heal. Uh, for yourself, show that same compassion for yourself. If you feel those deep feelings coming up and you think, why am I feeling this way? Take a moment to ask yourself gently and acknowledge, I'm feeling this way for a reason and it's okay. We have these emotions for a reason, process them. Um, practicing regular gratitude. We don't want to practice gratitude in a way that is um, sort of Pollyanna uh, and ignoring the feelings. Uh, we don't want to say, oh, well, you know, I have all this, so I'm not going to be sad about that. You can be sad, but you can also have a practice of acknowledging the good in your life. Uh, practices of gratitude uh, are very popular to be studied right now, and they all have really positive effects on our, our mental health. And so having a, a regular practice can be really healing. Journaling, whether you use prompts or just use a, a regular checklist or, um, you know, just documenting how you're feeling helps to take the internal and process it outward. And then positive self-talk, self-care, and self-compassion. And we're talking about self-care in a, a really, really uh, holistic way, not just a bubble bath. Uh, it is self-care, giving yourself time, respect, energy, space to heal, to process, to, to find, make meaning. When you're encountering someone that's grieving, sometimes uh, you may feel uncomfortable with the conversation. And this is what I have heard uh, time and time again from people who, uh, you know, <clears throat> people want to support them and they don't want them to be sad. And so anything that sort of taps down the sadness uh, so that, oh, you know, don't think about how, how sad this is. Think about what, what's good. That's not helpful. Silence is often better than saying something to squash their emotions. Um, being present, listening deeply, reflecting back what you hear, and acknowledging that you're not leaving them, that you're not afraid of their sadness, you're not afraid of their anger, that you are with them. These are more powerful than trying to squash the emotions and turn, make them look at the bright side. Um, more patients than I can count have said that they feel 
they have a very hard time with individuals who come and try to make them feel better. Uh, there, there is certainly you can do things to brighten someone's day, but telling them not to feel sad over a deep loss, whatever that loss may be, does not actually help them. It just makes them put on a mask in front of you. And wearing a mask all day, uh, especially an emotional one, uh, can be very tiring. So um, we want to make sure that we are not uh, squashing emotions or putting on blame. Um, so when someone makes a mistake, when somebody uh, is processing um, something that went poorly, uh, they lost a job, they uh, have financial struggles, uh, sometimes people will, will say, oh, now you know better. Maybe you should have listened to yourself. Maybe you should have listened to your intuition. Bet you won't discount your inner voice next time. That's not helpful either. So uh, allowing people space to share and be more vulnerable. Um, a, uh, a young woman that I was caring for, a colleague, uh, she expressed that she had been going through a very difficult time in her personal life. And then it had been uh, sort of bleeding into work. She was really struggling because uh, her husband was very sick and uh, they had a, a new child and they he was no longer working. She had all the financial load on her plate. Uh, work stress was was very high. She felt like things were falling falling apart. She wasn't keeping up with things the way she should. Um, and they had to move. Uh, and you know, moving is one of those things that are are very difficult and uh, can bring a lot of grief. So she left the home that she loved and moved into an apartment that she later found was terrible. Um, rodent and uh, and roach problems. Uh, just she said one night she got stuck. Uh, they had painted over the door so many times she got stuck in the in her room because it it had just kind of fused and she had to break the door down to get out. Um, and so she had all of this trauma from financial illness, being a, a new mom, work, and she didn't want to acknowledge um, the loss. She didn't acknowledge them as losses. She took them all as personal failings, that it was her fault that she had done these things. And she didn't want to tell anybody because the times that she had shared, they uh, they stuck with the practical. They tried to make her feel better, at least at least you have a roof over your head. It could be so much worse. Your husband could have died. He could have he could have been sicker than he was. You know, at least you have a baby. Uh, and it squashed down the feelings. Uh, so she didn't share anymore with her colleagues or friends. And uh, eventually didn't share until the things resolved. Uh, but the grief remained. That's the thing. The, though the physical things changed, her husband became well, her child's grown up, she's moved out of the bad place that she didn't want to be anymore, um, but she still carries that grief and now has to process that compounded instead of being able to process one thing at a time. And so when we're caring for our colleagues, our friends, we want to make sure that we are giving open space. If it's something that's personally triggering for you, if it's not a space where you can handle their grief, to acknowledge and say, you know, I'm with you. I feel deeply sad for you. I don't think I can help you with this, but I'd like to, I'd like to help you find the right person to help process. Because just because you are a caring and helping person doesn't mean you have to carry all of that. And so a good referral is, is just as good. Uh, it's better. And it's certainly better than saying the things that, uh, that squash feelings. So <clears throat> when we accompany someone who's in grief, we want to say something acknowledge that there's grief, acknowledge the elephant in the room. We want to be honest uh, and say that we're we're heartbroken. We don't have to hide that it's sad. That we don't have to hide that um, it is a difficult situation. We want to recognize the emotional content, repeat back the emotions that they're sharing. Sometimes you're wrong. There are plenty of times that I'm sitting with someone and say, wow, that sounds, that sounds, that would make me really angry, or you, you sound really frustrated by that. And then they'll say, no, no, I think I'm more disappointed. No, I think I'm more depressed about it. That's okay. Let them correct you. Just offer safe and open space to acknowledge what you're hearing and and make uh, make it okay for them to be sad. Uh, allow for there to be multiple feelings, um, especially in the situations of loss. 
there are times when, um, especially people who are caregivers, who are, who are the caregiver for someone who's very sick, there are times when they feel a sense of relief. They feel a sense of hope that, that their life might change or, or get better in some way. It doesn't mean that they're not grieving. They are still deeply grieving. But uh, for those who, especially those uh, who are in this like sandwich generation, taking care of, of parents and children, sometimes they feel a sense of relief when uh, someone who has been sick for a long time has passed away. And if we jump down with judgment, uh, they're not going to share anymore. And just because you have confusion or hope or fear doesn't mean you're not sad. And so acknowledging that we are complex beings and we can have a lot of different emotions. Embrace silence. Silence is so hard. We want to fill the space, but you don't have to fill every second with silence. Acknowledge it. Um, even now when I'm doing a lot more telesupport, I, it's not all families come into the hospital now. Um, I'll acknowledge, you know, I'm still here. I'm listening to you. Um, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just quietly listening. You know, I'm still here. Uh, you don't always have to do something. And it's okay to just be with somebody and honor the space. So uh, grief experts recommend 20 days of bereavement leave. And I think most of us do not have the luxury of being able to offer that. Um, the average uh, bereavement leave allotted for the death of a spouse is four days and uh, three days for other, other losses. Um, and so when we are offering care, one great way we can do this is by extending the number of days for bereavement leave wherever possible. We know it's not possible for all of us. Um, some of us even need to get back to work. Uh, we like the structure. But one thing that is a common uh, frustration for colleagues uh, or for particularly for, for staff is when somebody says, take as much time as you need. And it sounds so generous, right? Oh, take as much time as you need. But people will, more, more staff people will come back early out of fear that they have done something wrong. And so saying something instead, like, you know, we want to give you as much time as, as we can, you can take, you know, I recommend taking at least 10 days, if you can give that amount, you know, whatever it is, but give them, give them some recommendations, give them clear boundaries and expectations, take things off their plate, say, you know, I know you're going to take the next, the next week off after this loss, when you come back, I really don't want you to have to come sit in on any meetings. You're off of all meetings that week. Just come back and have a slow re-entry. Give them concrete ways of re-entering the workplace so that they can uh, have set boundaries and not be doing the mental gymnastics of, I'm trying to grieve and I'm trying to get back to work and I'm not taking everything into account. That is a way to join others. In our workplaces, it's important to train emotional intention, uh, intelligence offer trainings like this, get familiar with language to use and language to avoid, create checkpoints, block off reminders in your calendar. When somebody has had a loss in your community, whether it is somebody that is a colleague or someone who reports to you, uh, remind yourself when the birthday of that loved one who passed away is, uh, what anniversary is, the anniversary of their death, and make it just a, a light check-in. It doesn't have to be over the top. It can just be a, hey, I'm thinking of you this day. Um, I had a, a friend who lost a child and I would make a donation to, uh, an organization every year on, on his birthday, uh, related to, to his illness. And she gets a little notification that just says somebody donated in the name of, of your child. Uh, and that's just on my calendar every year. Um, it doesn't have to be financial. You can certainly do whatever, whether whatever you want to do to connect with your your community. Get creative. Offer those rituals, donation opportunities, walks. Offer spaces to share stories, uh, and listen. Listening is the most powerful thing that you can do. Uh, offering quiet and gentle space for people to actually share what's going on without uh, without stopping them, without squashing their emotions, and allow them to help you find a creative way to heal and empower them to do those things uh, for their healing. A reminder about first call, use the resources that you have. Um, get that in the moment support. Uh, use the, the free sessions uh, by video or by phone. 
uh, make sure you get the resources that you need and remind others to use them too. Having them is great, but if you don't use them, then you're not going to benefit from it. Um, we need to reduce the stigma of getting therapy and therapeutic uh, interventions because these things work. They help us. And so uh, we want to make sure that we are engaging in everything that is at our disposal. So we're going to remember grief is a big concept. Uh, there are many ways to support and heal. We have gone through so many different things in a very short amount of time. Um, it can feel daunting. Grief is certainly something that we may be afraid of because it stirs feelings within ourselves. Focus on yourself first. Put that mask on, uh, that, that, you know, the, the airplane metaphor. Put the mask on before you put it on somebody else so that you can, you can give back. Um, make sure that you're not afraid to engage in another person's grief. Um, we don't have to be perfect. Uh, we don't have to have the exact right thing to say when somebody talks to us, they're not going to leave just like, oh, you fixed me, you cured me. No, but we can be a, a stepping stone, uh, show compassion, give space for big emotions, uh, and don't try to minimize grief, your own or others by comparing to the loss of another person. Um, our, our loss is our own, and we should give it the space that it needs to heal with gentleness, compassion, and grace. Um, there are a couple comments about first call. And I might ask Kara to give more detail about that. But this is my contact information for those who have uh, questions for me off offline. Um, and I want to give you guys the it last eight minutes of the session to ask any other questions that you might have. Uh, but Kara, anything that you can say about first call? Absolutely. Thank you so much. First and foremost, Casey, I think um, one of the big takeaways is just being gentle and caring for yourself as we try to also care for others. And uh, whether that's through grief and loss or a change in transition, there's, there's so many constant um, changes in our world and in our lives. So maybe we're going through a good time, life is going well, but our colleagues suffering through something. So it's always good to uh, have a reminder of what, <laughs> what not to say and, and what we can say in a positive way and how to actually be a support for others. So um, I did see that Lisa is asking about the 800 number. The 800 number is for all our accounts. You can call the 800 number and they actually provide in the moment support right then and there. And then we receive a report and you'll hear back from our care coordinator and we can get set up. You can get set up for uh, sessions. There's legal support. There's financial support. Again, you know, grief is not necessarily just death. There can be some grief and loss surrounding finances um, or stress. So we can help in so many different ways. If you just call and want to ask questions, we can get you the correct information. Please remember that the sessions that you have available to you aren't just for you. They're for all household members. So I love that. It expands to, to spouses, to children. Um, so if maybe you're not the one who's suffering, but you know somebody in your household or even a colleague, say, hey, do you remember about first call? We'd be happy to uh, give people the support that they need. And if we're not the right place, we're also a great resource. We'll, we'll help get you to the right spot. So um, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Casey, for this great information. And uh, it looks like there's another. So we don't, off, EAP doesn't offer uh, chaplain services, um, unfortunately. So I'm wondering if that's, hopefully I answered that question <laughs> correctly. Um, For those who are part of Mainline Health who are on the call, there is a chaplain at all um, all four of our acute care hospitals, as well as uh, Bryn Mawr Rehab Hospital. And if there are chaplaincy questions, um, I'm always happy to answer them, and I will put you in contact with the right person. Um, a lot of your community clergy have, have been required to train in uh, at least one unit of chaplaincy education. And so um, I'm happy to put referrals out if you ever need something that are that's closer to your area. Uh, a lot of us know each other, so <laughs> we can we can help find you the right person.